And then it was up to last Thursday. I was talking quite a lot about parental alienation. And I didn't go back to it on Friday's programme. Because Friday's programme can be somewhat different. Uh, And then Monday got away from me because it was a bank holiday. And then yesterday and, and, and today we've been talking about different topics and, you know, I did leave a lot of unfinished business with regards to people sharing their own stories regarding breakups and how children then are used by one parent against another. Interestingly, in the conversations that I was having, it's not just against dads. It can also be against mams. But at the weekend then, I had a conversation uh, off air, which we recorded with a chap called John, who got in touch following our chats on the air about it, particularly with Selena Furlong last week when she was talking about the subject of parental alienation, uh, you know, where the child becomes estranged from a parent as a result of the psychological manipulation of the other parent. So I spoke to John at the weekend uh, and he was talking on behalf of a a new organisation that has been set up in Ireland now, this new organisation that's been set up uh, to help people who are going through parental alienation. Uh, It's called, uh, I'll give you the name of it in a moment because uh, if you might want to reach out and get in touch with them. But he was chatting with me how parental alienation affects more than than just the child's mother or father. It's the entire family. And there is a a group and an organisation that he's part of. Um, I think it's um, Alienated Children Ireland First, I think is the name of the organisation. He's a member of that. And uh, we just caught up at the weekend. Have a listen to some of it. And as you said, it doesn't just affect the person as in you as a dad, but extended family as well, yeah? Because everybody's cut off. So, the extended family and my extended family who would have been involved and close and known or my family well have been completely shut off. And the worst affected in that has been my their grandmother who had reared and helped rear them all their lives from kids right through all their stages of school had been completely cut off. And through no fault of her own, she found herself mourning for grandchildren yeah. that were still um, up and about, moving about, and she could, just couldn't see her, have contact or be part of their lives. Just, yeah, just on the subject of, of grandparents or a grandmother, w- would she see them at a distance or even like anything like that? She would have seen them if she met them on the road passing. That would be it. She would have contacted them and rang them. She wouldn't be able to text or watch up, but she would have rang them and just no answer, no reply or no ring back, and which would have been totally out of character because if their granny rang for them at any point prior to this, they would drop all and go to her. They adored her and loved her. I know what you're saying. I know what you're saying. It, it can be like mourning a, a death or a passing, isn't it? At the end of a relationship where somebody is just living a completely separate existence. So when a relationship ends, it is, a, it is like a death and a mourning and it does take a particularly long time to process and deal with it. But for an alienation, it's a different type of grief. And it's a different kind of trauma. Now, I, I understand and I've had trauma in my life and I've lost my father and other close uncles and friends and I understand the whole uh, dynamic of grief and trauma from a debt. But unless you experience the alienation, there is a very few words that can describe it or put it in context. It's a constant grief and loss and it's felt tight in your chest and your heart and it's like this lump stuck in you all day every day and for fathers of course were you going to say you yearn for the contact yes yes yeah it's a it's the exclusion and the bullying that i i I describe it as that you're it's like a child in the schoolyard being bullied that's excluded and now we're not loud player not to look at the games or not be involved and would you say I mean it seems to be an awful lot more prevalent than I had thought um, you know over the past couple of days I've been inundated with emails and texts difficult to put calls on air I have to say because of issues involving courts and what have you but would you say it's qu- that, that there's a lot of it happening I would I, I would say and I never knew what the term parental alienation was until it landed on my doorstep and from the people I've met and involved I can say it is rampant, rampant throughout the country cities, towns, villages countryside, it's 
absolutely rampant and the pandemic may have increased um, separations and if you look at the statistics from the, from the courts there's been a huge amount of applications for safety orders etc cetera, etc cetera, regarding and the knock on from that is most of these cases is parental alienation involved so I can safely say it is rampant in our community. And have you found talking with others that protection orders are used as a tool and a weapon as well against dads? Absolutely. Are there false allegations made? So it's not just against dad and there is no gender um, bias and his mothers are, are suffer from parental alienation as well and it's, it's quite difficult. Okay, well, fair play to you for being fair and balanced about it, but I would imagine I would hazard not to the same extent. Not to the same extent, yes. Yes. But I can say is that the legal system, while very important to our system and our, the laws of the land, has been used and manipulated to bolster or jockey for position in in separation cases and safety orders and etc. have been used to further alienate parents from their children. Oh my, yeah. I, I understand what you're saying, yeah. yeah. That, 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 at the end of the day, it's the, it's, it's the weaponizing of a child against an ex-partner. Yes. And if I may say that, um, to do that... It, the sight of the welfare of the child has been lost by the system. Mm. In that, um, I consider it the last socially acceptable form of child abuse in our communities because everybody knows a mum and a dad uh, that's separating or parting ways and mum doesn't get to see the kids or dad doesn't dad, get yeah. to see the kids or grannies or uncles doesn't get to see the kids. And us as a society and a people are turning a blind eye and allowing this be the norm or allowed. Nobody is standing up in our community and the professional people are there. Do you have, we have the judiciary, we have the legal side, we have psychologists and professionals and we even have our, our own guard shake on and they all have a difficult job to do. But the welfare of the child should be paramount. And it's not being seen. And back, if we go back a number of years and we look back, society and the professionals all knew what was happening in the tomb baby homes, the laundries, the industrial schools for the boys. Everybody knew and nobody said stop. Yeah, yeah. So it's time we stopped and looked at where we are. And I have to commend Helen McEntee, who has brought a bit of light on this. But it needs to be addressed in our communities by ourselves. Because the innocence of a child is being lost. No child is ever born into this world to not like or hate its mum or its dad. And do you talk... That it's trained into them, yeah. It's yeah, uh, they're coerced into it. Do you do you do you talk with many fathers who then are mothers, for that matter, who've been victims of the alienation, who then get to reconnect with their children when they get a little bit older, and and what do the children say to them? So, from the parenting group and uh, alienation children first is a group in Ireland that helps mums and dads to understand and get through this, and very few get through the system unscathed in that there, there is time lost can never be recovered. But when children become young adults and they begin to see things and they have a better way of their rationale and their thinking, they wonder, well, why don't I speak to mum? Or why don't I speak to dad? Or maybe their friends or, or boyfriends or, or girlfriends that they form relationships with ask those pointing questions and when the rationale doesn't stack up and stand up the yeah, reasons yeah. are seen for what they are. And do they reach out then to the parent? In some cases they do, yes. They do. Um, but they're also, like this is child abuse. There's no, can't call it anything other than that because the psychological and the mental yeah. and how they form their own relationships carries through in their lives. Yes, I saw some research during the week that spoke about issues uh, as a consequence of this for a young man or a young woman later in life, or even as yeah. children, and it, it did include uh, um, 
trust issues, issues forming relationships, anxiety, stress, emotional problems, um, uh, substance abuse, performing very badly in school, giving them a bad career choice then, you know, those kind of things? Yes, that is the knock-on effect of this and it's unquantified and it's unmeasured in our society other than it is. It is a growing cancer because for every child or children in a relationship that is damaged by parental alienation, they go forward and may cause the same level of damage to some other oh my God, innocent of course. Yeah, yeah. person that's in a relationship. And it's, it has to be stopped. What are we rearing as a consequence? Yeah, yeah. What yes. are we sending out into the world? Yeah, yeah. And the, and the dads or the mums, um, and again, we're saying it can happen to both sexes, yeah. if you like, but they don't all make it through. Some crack, don't they? They just can't go on. So I can tell you from my own personal experience, I have had the darkest days and night ever born by anyone to stay on the road. And when I mean the road, I mean the road of life. Yeah. And without the help and support from my family, my very good friends, and a counsellor, and I think counselling is key, anyone that's involved in this, is to reach out and get the help. Because there is help out there. But some parents, unfortunately, and since Christmas last year, I know of three dads and two mums that just couldn't bear it no longer. Five and people. This world. Three dads and two mums who just couldn't take that, it anymore. Yeah. They were broken down, beaten down by it. Beaten down. The games and the antics that goes on in it, in, in breaching of access and denying access and false accusations and the judiciary has a role to play here in this, that people make up statements and false accusations and when they're proven to be unfounded, there is no consequence. Well, that should be changed in law straight away. Uh, straight away. So for a mum or a dad to accuse another mum or another dad of um, some of the most horrendous possible things you could think of to do to their own child and for it to be unproven, unfounded and to be allowed just go with no consequence. That is the problem. I know. Because yeah. if there was a consequence for saying somebody touched somebody inappropriately or whatever, they wouldn't be calling those accusations without hard fact and evidence. And it needs to stop. It's the false accusations that's in family courts that's just... It's nearly like accepted norm that nobody tells the truth in there. It's, it's yes, you but you do realise that they're all... Inside. What? It's nearly the story you can make up to bolster your side. Yes, I know, I know. But when it's in camera, you see, it's, it's, it's wrong to blame the public or society because they're in camera. We never know of the stories because they're behind closed doors stories, you see. Yes. You know? I, I, I agree with that, but I think the tide is turning on that in that people um, that have come through the system and seen it have had enough and they're speaking out. They are. I've because seen that. it cannot be allowed and... I have to commend you and the radio program for covering this because it's it's not um, popular to talk about unpleasant things in our society and the young baby's got it very hard to get a call or a break with media and radio and, and being publicised. And when it did, everybody came on board and you, could see what was happening and how it happened. And so you think this is one of the uns, untackled scandals of our time? A relationship, absolutely. yeah, absolutely. You say where a relationship breaks down and an ex-partner alienates their ex-partner from the children by lying and making up stories about them. The only, uh, the only positive thing I can come from this conversation so far is that in some cases when the children grow up to be young adults, they start asking questions for themselves and go investigating their dad that yeah. they haven't seen or their mothers they haven't seen. But I guess not all of them do. I guess not all of them do. Um, but you would hope that with public awareness and the public knowledge campaign that they would read or see and inform themselves and begin to ask the questions. And when it's out there, a secret only has power so long as it remains a secret yes, and true, hidden. True. And when, when you throw a light on this dark area of life, people read it and understand it and spot it. 
Listen, I know that Charlie, Charlie McGill is walking from, mm-hmm. uh, I think he's, he's walking from down West Corkway, isn't Don Skibbereen? And he's right. walking yeah. all the way to Antrim to highlight parental alienation because it was reading yeah. that he knows of many people witness many of those close to him going through the pain of what we've just discussed here. Um, and he wants to highlight that it exists. And as you say, it could well be the scandal of our time. Are you going to walk with him for a while? So I'm going to walk with Charlie on Sunday and Monday. I was to go today, but things didn't pan out for me to do so. Charlie's journey and walk is very, very significant in, it, in that it's not just a walk. Mm. It, it, it shows the challenge, the difficulties and the enormity that a parent faces when they're alienated from their children. And along that road, there is many, many pitfalls and, and obstacles to get through and overcome to get to the finish. And I see Charlie's finish as being uh, raising the awareness, raising some some funding to be able to pro- help mothers and fathers out there. And each day I, I couldn't be on the road with commitments, but I've got up each morning at five and six and I walk five or six K each morning. And it's therapeutic to walk, to know that uh, we're all walking together. I know. It's a unity yeah. and we're no longer excluded. We'll form our own band and we will help stop this parental alienation and very grateful for your help in Not at all. Doing so. Not at all. Not at all. Yeah, I'll chat with Charlie and I'll catch up with him and see how the walk is going. John, what organisation have you guys come together under? Like, what group do you represent? So, uh, there's a group there that I, I stumbled across by, by great luck. They're called... Um, Alienated Children First Ireland and um, Ken Joyce and many, many others uh, keep this group together and put on webinars with experts from across the globe on parental alienation and how parents to handle it and deal with it and how to approach it and understand it. Because until you see what it is and research it a little bit, it's completely uh, alien to anybody and it's so complex, it takes a lot of understanding to understand the dynamic of how the children are affected and how they operate and how um, yourself to manage it and to manage your own self and emotions and how you interact with your children. Oh, it's uh, going to be upsetting as well as frustrating absolutely yes. every day, just to put one foot in front of the other. Alienated children first, first Ireland. Ireland. Yeah, yeah. I'm, get, I'm getting a sense of how really bad or how big a problem it is over the past few days with texts and emails and contacts from members of the public, either themselves or indeed brothers and sisters or mothers or fathers might be on about their yeah. sons, you know, or in, as you say, their daughters. But listen, thank you so much for taking the call. Do feel free to stay in touch. It's lovely chatting with you. Absolutely, and I really appreciate um, you doing this and helping parents, but you, in doing so, you're helping many, many children who one day will see what this has happened to them and why. And we'll be grateful for people to stand up and presenters like yourself to speak out and help rid our country from this cancer in our society. So I want everybody to open up and shine the light on this um, toxic, abusive system of parental alienation and say no more. We would not have this amongst our children, amongst our adults, amongst our families, on our communities. We want it rid. Good man. Thanks, John. Appreciate you taking the call. Thank you. That organisation is called Alienated Children First Ireland. Thank you to John for coming on air. Apologies for the quality of the line in parts, but I think it was a powerful conversation with him. You know, you can I can I can always judge topics that garner more response or texts or emails and calls than say other topics. And this is one. Any time that I bring it up or we discuss it on air, I get huge amounts of correspondence on it. I really do. Um, and and it, it, to some extent, it's a, it can be a, it can be a legal nightmare dealing with much of the stories that people share with me. You can't put all of them on air because there are two sides to every story, and you could in a breakup situation where you have two partners, a man and a woman, or you know, I, I understand the dynamics changing now, two men, two women. I understand all of that, but in the case of somebody telling a story live on air. You have somebody else listening, and in this defamatory legal quagmire that we live in in this country, you're very careful about what you can actually put on air. But you can get stories from people by email or, or by text. And here's just another few. Listening about breakups. 
This couple broke up and they have four lovely children, but the father can't see the kids at all. She is totally against him. Um, she has the kids totally against him. And he was an excellent dad. Uh, he has moved on in his life with the girlfriend, but is heartbroken over his children as he never sees them now. She blocked them at the beginning from going anywhere with him. And he went time after time for them and never got them. Now the relationship between himself and the kids has completely broken down. I feel so sorry for him. I think the dads come out worse uh, and the children now are all having counselling. It's heartbreaking to see these lovely kids who are now suffering themselves. Another one, asking a solicitor to be part of a conversation where their own profession is being brought into question. is like asking turkeys to vote for Christmas. You said it yourself, Neil. How many men have contacted you because they have a path worn in and out of the courthouse? And that's just men who contacted your show. I, all I can tell you is that I've seen this from both sides. There was a well-known lady judge on the Late Late Show a good few years ago. I remember the host asking her if men get treated equally in family court and she replied... Unfortunately, no. She also said that men going back and forth to court to try and prove their cases has led to many of them taking their own lives. Her words. Can you imagine she was telling the Irish people back then and the only thing that has changed is the increase in the legal fees for the men of Ireland. When I hear about equality for all, it makes me smile. Women only want to be on an equal footing when it suits the vast majority of women. And this comes from a man who has seen both sides of this horrible fact. A family member lost out for being honest in a situation like this and lost so much. Lost his house, his children and was left half the man he was after his marriage breakup. Let me give you one or two more. I'm 31. My parents had a dysfunctional relationship from as early as I can remember. They separated when I was 12. Uh, My brothers and I were not allowed to have contact with our dad. I didn't talk to him for nearly 10 years at the direction of my mother. They did not finalise their divorce until five years ago. Hundreds of thousands were spent on solicitors, barristers and courts. I wouldn't wish it on my worst enemy. Thank you for that text. It's, um, there, there's a lot more to that story that you don't share where you say you didn't talk to him for 10 years. Did, as you got older, you know, did you start thinking for yourself and then get back in touch with your dad, I wonder? Recently, myself and my ex-wife had to attend a psychologist for a family law court matter. I paid the psychologist my share for both of us attending him, plus the cost of the report he'd have to submit to the court. My share of the costs was uh, short of €1,500. My solicitor recently subpoenaed him to court on my behalf. I had to pay another €950 before he would attend. I'm currently paying 50% of the cost towards a co-parent mediator. The costs are ridiculous. I've paid almost €10,000 this year alone dealing with access issues and the case is still ongoing and far from concluded. That's just the selection. There are many more. I'll dip in and out of them back after the break. Get it off your chest. Call Neil Prenderville now. And then it was up to last Thursday. I was talking quite a lot about parental alienation. And I didn't go back to it on Friday's programme because Friday's programme can be somewhat different. Uh, And then Monday got away from me because it was a bank holiday. And then yesterday and, and, and today, we've been talking about different topics and, you know. But I did leave a lot of unfinished business with regards to people sharing their own stories regarding breakups and how children then are used by one parent against another. Interestingly, in the conversations that I was having, it's not just against dads. It can also be against mams. But at the weekend then, I had a conversation uh, off air, which we recorded with a chap called John who got in touch following our chats on the air about it, particularly with Selena Furlong last week when she was talking about the subject of parental alienation, uh, you know, where the child becomes estranged from a parent as a result of the psychological manipulation of the other parent. So I spoke to John at the weekend, uh, and he was talking on behalf of a a new organisation that has been set up in Ireland now, this new organisation that's been set up uh, to help people who are going through parental alienation. Uh, It's called, uh, I'll give you the name of it in a moment because uh, if you might want to reach out and get in touch with them. But he was chatting with me how parental alienation affects more than than just the child's mother or father. It's the entire family. And there is a a group and an organisation that he's part of. Um, I think it's um, Alienated Children Ireland First, I think is the name of the organisation. He's a member of that. And uh, we just caught up at the weekend. Have a listen to some of it. 
And as you said, it doesn't just affect the person as in you as a dad, but extended family as well, yeah? Because everybody's cut off. So the extended family and my extended family who would have been involved and close and known or my family well have been completely shut off. And the worst affected in that has been my their grandmother who had reared and helped rear them all their lives from kids right through all their stages of school had been completely cut off. And through no fault of her own, she found herself mourning for grandchildren that were still...